April of 2023. This year, we are presenting a variety of formats. Last month, some of us enjoyed a field trip to log house plants. Today, we're going back to Zoom. And next month, Jan Gano will present a face-to-face -face seminar at the Extension Office in Eugene. As always, the details of all the seminars are on the OSU Extension Lane County events page. My name is Stephen, and I will be your host for tonight's seminar, where Nicole Sanchez will lead us through the application of integrated pest management techniques to insects in the home vegetable garden. Before we get started, a few housekeeping items. This seminar is being recorded and a recording will be available at the LCMGA YouTube site within about two weeks. You'll also find recordings there of our previous presentations. Closed captioning is enabled and it can be turned on or off with the CC button at the bottom of your screen. Also, during the talk, everyone will be muted. So to ask a question, please type into the Q&A box and we will answer as many questions as we can during the time allotted at the end of the seminar. If you wake up in the night with additional questions, then please contact your local extension office and we will try to help. When you leave the seminar, you will be asked to fill out a short evaluation to help us improve on our program. Okay, it looks like Nicole is back. Excellent. So now to our speaker. Nicole Sanchez is an associate professor of practice at the Oregon State University Klamath Basin Research and Extension Center. She works with both commercial and home horticulture programs, as well as various insect related projects. Previously, Nicole studied horticulture and entomology at the University of Tennessee. She worked in botanical gardens in Georgia and served as a crop consultant at North Carolina State before coming to Oregon in 2016. Now, when I was recruiting speakers for this seminar series, I asked around master gardeners for recommendations. A common theme was just get Nicole to present something. It doesn't matter what topic, the seminar will be great. So Nicole, it's over to you. Oh my goodness, thank you so much. How kind of the Master Gardeners. Uh, I'm getting a message that my internet's um, not very great. So I'm not gonna use my camera once I get started in my slides. That way uh, that might help out a little bit. Thank you for such a kind introduction. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen. And let me move some things here so I can navigate just a little better. So um, I'm going to just start right up by changing the name of the presentation to Earth Friendly Pest Control in the Vegetable Garden. I am thrilled that so many of you came to a topic called integrated pest management, but I would suggest to you that as master gardeners, you think about um, how you talk about this topic with our clients. So IPM is super important, but it that acronym and the phrase integrated pest management don't necessarily resonate with all of the folks that we work with. And in fact, um, this is a point of discussion uh, within IPM practitioners and educationers or educators. Um, we talk about this a lot because it's just not a great um, phrase that really connects with people in terms of what all it entails. I jokingly switched you to earth friendly, but there's no standards associated with a term like that. Whereas with IPM concepts, those actually uh, began development in the 70s, and we're seeing them more and more widely adopted. So thank you for your interest in this. Again, 
Um, we might think about how we would talk to this to our clients about this topic rather than that phrase IPM. So um, terminology will vary from one resource to another that you might use. So uh, be aware that if you read up on this, and there's a lot of great material out there, you'll see some terms used a little bit differently. Some categories will have four and other authors will give them five. What's most important is that we understand how to use this tool. So we're going to start with some basics of IPM to kind of make sure we're all on the same page with that. And then we'll dive into some specific applications of that um, with, that, with the vegetables. So if we're talking about pest management, we want to start with making sure that we are appropriately defining what a pest is. Um, it can be an insect or disease or a pathogen, though we'll be focusing on insects tonight. Many of the uh, concepts that we talk about could also be applied to diseases. And even if the insect um, could be a pest, it's sometimes situational. We don't have to always consider them pests. Consider, for example, the asparagus beetle up at the upper uh, right hand corner of the screen there, you know, if he comes along after you're done harvesting your asparagus for the year, that might be a different management um, situation than if you see it right away, right, because you're harvesting the asparagus for a very short period of time. Um, another concept that's tough for some folks is that typically IPM does require some level of pest tolerance. We talk about encouraging beneficial insects into our systems. We talk about um, having those predators and parasitoids in the system. There have to be some prey there for them to eat or they'll go on to other places. There's well over a million species of insects that have been identified by entomologists and only about 5% of those known insect species could be considered pests of humans. And I ask you, how does that relate to humans? Pests, human pests more or less than 5%? Because for the insects, it's only 5%. You have to keep in mind that just like on the news, we typically hear the things that are negative, right? We hear about the strange and odd things people do, and we tend to focus more on the pests that are problems for us. And sometimes it's a, it's good to recognize that they're actually fewer than you might realize. So IPM is really about pulling a variety of toolkits or arsenals of pest control methods. That's where that integrated part comes in. So you're going to be using multiple things, sometimes simultaneously. In order to really do this well, it does require some knowledge and time. It requires a little bit of dedication. And that doesn't mean that you have to learn about every insect pest out there. You could start with some of the most common and get to know some IPM strategies for them. You don't have to learn all of them, but you do want to have kind of a deeper level of understanding of the life cycle of the pest in many cases. This is gonna help you figure out which is the best tool to use. Another consideration is the idea of management versus eradication. I can remember my entomology professor a long time ago now, joking about how many times the Mediterranean fruit fly had been, air quotes, eradicated from Florida because it would just keep getting reintroduced on other shipments of fruit. So uh, again, with the idea of integrated pest management, we wanna consider that management aspect instead of having the expectation that every single pest is going to be gone. So we'll rethink those pest levels. And then hopefully as you have become more practiced in your IPM, you'll be able to determine some thresholds that work for you that help you figure out when it's time to take action. And we will talk more about those. I want to spend just a quick minute talking about the overlap between IPM and organic production. I'm often asked, which one is better? 
they're really both great strategies to use. And in fact, you could use both of them in your garden if you choose, but they're kind of like a Venn diagram with some overlap. So both of these systems use pesticides. Uh, remember that organic uh, production does often include pesticides as well, but both use other methods as well. So in organic production, we're using only products that come from a natural source. There are some exemptions for commercial use, but IPM doesn't make that designation between organic or conventional pesticide. It does, however, encourage us to use the other tools before we get to pesticide. And if you wanted to use IPM along with an organic approach, then if it came to the time that you needed to use a pesticide, you would choose an organic one. Organic production has a much heavier focus on building long-term soil health and paying attention to the entire production system where integrated pest management is really more focused on those pest cycles, but you see how they could work very well together. So I think of IPM as having four really important components that we need to build into our IPM practice. The first one is knowing what you're dealing with. Uh, the second one is monitoring. Some references will call that scouting. You will also have to determine some thresholds for action. Other resources will call those control guidelines. Those are gonna be similar terms for the same thing. And then there's a whole variety of control tools that we'll take a look at. So I think we are moving as a population past the type of spray that ortho used to boldly proclaim in the garden center, kill 67 kind of bugs dead in a real like proud kind of stance, right? Uh, folks realize that we don't necessarily want to kill all of the species of bugs. So if we're going to target any of our products to a specific pest, we really need to know what it is. I don't want that to be intimidating for our master gardeners. Um, you know, sometimes being able to recognize the family or group that an insect comes from is just as helpful as being able to get it down to a species. An example of that would be aphids, for example. You know, some of our control measures for aphids are generally going to be the same, regardless of which aphid species it is. And there's like 3,000 of them. It is helpful to know where is it from. Our network here in Oregon does a great job of letting us know when new pests are being introduced and that we should be on the lookout for them. But it's helpful to realize that um, something is part of our natural system, it's native to this area, or it's coming in from a different area that can sometimes help us with control, control strategies. We often want to consider how often it will reproduce or how many generations per year is an insect going to have. And this is a particular thing that I think it's important for us to remind ourselves about the value of seeking resources from our region. So I'm sure that many of you, for instance, are familiar with the PNW guides, right? And they're going to offer potentially some information about the reproductive cycles, how many generations per year for our area. But further south, that same insect might have more generations per year. So just keep that in mind. If you read things that seemingly conflict when you're brushing up on your insects that actually they can be pretty different in different parts of the country. Just yesterday, I was having a discussion with one of our master gardener trainees in Klamath about how earwigs are generally not considered a pest in the Eastern United States and how surprised I was and other people have been to see how vigorously they eat our favorite plants here in Oregon. Another thing that's helpful uh, when we're looking at the pest is understanding the dispersal pattern. And we can ask our clients about this without using the term dispersal pattern, but we can say, you know, where did you see this first? Is it on all of your plants? Did you notice it at the top of the plant? Uh, when did you find it? All of these things can help us get to the bottom of what we're trying to figure out there. How much damage does it do? And what part of the plant will it actually eat? So these are all things that are helpful to know about the pest. Remember that 
understanding the life cycle a little bit more intimately can really help us target some of our treatments at the time when they're going to have the most impact with the least impact to other creatures in our systems. So monitoring or scouting is another one of the components that we need to use in our IPM practice. And honestly, the earlier, the better. And I don't mean early in the day, although that can be a good time, but you want to catch infestations of your pests pretty early in their manifestation, because the sooner you figure out that they're there, the more options you're likely to have. So examples of that would be most of our caterpillar pests, you know, some of the easiest things to use on them like diatomaceous earth or BT that are earth friendly and possibly organically certified, those things are most effective when those caterpillars are really small and they're early in stars. They're almost ineffective if you don't notice that caterpillar until it's about to pupate into a butterfly. Um, another example of that would be with your aphids. Have you caught that infestation early when they're just on one plant? Or did you notice it because winged ones were leaving the plant? Those are really different scenarios in terms of the population size that you're trying to deal with. So whether you're in your home greenhouse or your garden that's in rows or you're out checking um, your raised beds, try to use a random pattern when you're monitoring and not look at it the same way in the same order every time, but to mix things up a little bit and repeat that throughout the season. And if you really want to get serious about integrated pest management, keeping records of when you first see pests and what you saw them on can turn out to be hugely informative when you're trying to predict in later years when you might see those guys again. So relative to monitoring, our P&W guides do tell us a lot about when we can expect emergence in Oregon. We all know that some years are different than others. So those are really a guide to give us an idea. And we have a pretty significant difference between the Eastern and Western parts of the state. A more reliable and precise way to predict when insects are going to emerge is by using a degree day model. And OSU does have a variety of those available to us. Um, I'm sorry, I don't, I think I have the link for that later in here. I'm sorry if I don't, but we do have a variety of those. You need to have a little bit of information about weather stations closer to you, but you can plug in some information and actually predict, for instance, um, when a pest is most likely to be active in your area. And then remember that a lot of things are coming into our farms or our gardens from other people's yards, from the weedy ditch patch between my house and the people that live on the next street. They're flying in from other places. So um, looking at the margins of your garden space can also be informative. Oh, sorry there. Let's see. Okay. Sorry, my finger got a little fumbly there. So some other things we can do to help model our monitor or figure out when pests are available are a variety of traps, right? So be clear that there are some traps that are used to determine absence or presence of the insect. And there are also traps that are used for actual control of the insect. They're not always the same thing. Um, so you can use these degree day models to try to figure out when to look. You can use journals if you collect that information over time. And then all of our other uh, websites and garden journals and those types of things that are pertinent to our area. Again, it's gonna be really different if you're looking at information from another state that doesn't have similar climates. So one example of monitoring traps would be sticky traps. They come in a variety of colors. You can also make your own with plastic plates and tangle foot or Vaseline. Uh, the idea is to have them up above the plant material, up above the leaf matter, kind of like a flower would be. And the reason for the different colors is that uh, some insects are attracted to slightly different colors. So you might choose your color of sticky trap based on what you're trying to test for. 
And this is just an example of some random patterns. Uh, this is more for a large garden or row crops. But again, to emphasize that idea that you're not going to walk through it the same way every time, because that's how we overlook things and miss them. All right, let me take a breath here. So your control guidelines will also be known as thresholds, depending on what you're looking at. And to make this one a little bit more complicated, there are also a different types of thresholds. So a commercial producer has to use some type of economic threshold, right? Because at the end of the day, they have to be a viable business. But we as home gardeners can use our own set of thresholds. And often for ornamental plants, the threshold is aesthetic, right? I can't tolerate um, once it gets to the point where the plant doesn't look healthy or I'm not getting flowers out of it or the plant is not able to serve its purpose. Regardless of which threshold we pick and what type of action, the idea is that we want some kind of guideline to help us figure out if we need to do something or if we can give nature time to take its course. And there are huge volumes of this type of information around field crops, right? Because those are the pest and plant interactions that we have the most research for. When it gets down to the thousands of different ornamental plants that we have in our gardens as home gardeners or as vegetable gardeners, there are fewer specific things. So when I say that there are specific ones in field crops, I mean, it tells you like, if you go out in the corn at this at knee height and you swing your net 10 times and you get this many of insect X, then you're okay. But if you get this many, you need to come back and treat, right? Like it's very specific depending on the insect that you're talking about. Um. And we don't have these for everything, but be aware that as you are working through how you'll utilize IPM in your, your own garden, you'll realize that some of your decisions are being made on this basis. All right. Another thing that's helpful to remember is that sometimes you don't need to do anything and you will encounter some clients who struggle with that, who feel like they really need to do something about it, but it's not always necessary. But when we do need to do some controls, it's not unusual for us to choose a couple things together. So for example, we might choose a resistant plant that has really hairy leaves, especially on the underside that are not as conducive to insect laying right? Laying their eggs, they, they don't like those hairy leaves sometimes. But we might also go out and inspect the leaves and scrape off what few eggs we do have. One of those is a cultural control by using a resistant variety. And then the other one is a physical control because you're physically removing those eggs, but you might do both of those. Um, and again, the more you understand about the pest and think about how its life cycle uh, leans towards different management styles, then the better you'll get to control. And so much of that is because of timing. So I'll use a non-vegetable garden example that I do a lot of work with here in Klamath Falls to really uh, nail down this timing idea. And that's the bronze birch borer, right? So it is a destructive pest of birch trees. And I start seeing the signs of it about in July when the adults emerge. And you can you can sometimes see it earlier than that. But most people notice the flagging trees in late August and September when it's too late to treat for that year. And so it's really hard for them when they just realize it to realize they've missed the window of opportunity for treatment. And now they have to wait until next year to be able to do anything about it. That's a really extreme example, but there are many, many examples of where timing is important. Keep in mind that a lot of things that we have available to us in terms of pesticide products, even in organic products, they do better on juvenile insects because they're 
skin, their exoskeleton is not as hard. It's not as chitinous. And so they absorb a lot of the material more easily as uh, young than they do as an adult. A lot of products don't get through the pupa or the egg. And so you might have to use a product more than one time because you didn't get all the eggs or you didn't get the pupa. And another example of timing would be things like scale and mealybug that build up those barriers of ick that they exude from their body that keep a contact pesticide from being able to penetrate down to the insect. For scale, the crawlers or uh, early instars of those are typically only active for a very few weeks in the springtime. That's the best time to be able to treat for them, but that's not when most of us catch them. So this is really important though, because any type of um, treatment that we offer at the wrong time is really just a waste of our resources, our money, our time, putting product out into the environment. Um, coddling moth is an example like that. So you really wanna have those traps out there before you see damage. By the time you see damage, the mating season has come and gone, right? That timing is really important. Sawflies are another example. So these are often found in trees and people notice them when they start dropping out of the trees to pupate. Well, that's not a time that you could potentially treat for them. Um, seed bugs. So we have the box elder bug and all these guys that get into the homes. There's very little advantage to a fall spray. That's when they tend to get um, on people's nerves. And we mentioned the BT on the caterpillar. So just really honing in lots of examples of why we want to understand the life cycle because the timing is really important to getting this to work. All right. So those are like the different components of the program. We've identified the pest. We've monitored. We know what, what's out there. We've reached a point of action and now it's time to do something about it. So there are our natural controls these are things that exist in our system that we don't have much control of, but it's helpful to understand them. And then the host plant resistance, cultural, mechanical, physical, biological, and chemical controls. This is where we have the ability to, to make some choices in our uh, gardening practice. So natural controls are things like climate. So I am in Klamath Falls, where very little about our climate is gardener friendly. Uh, we got snow yesterday and today. It's supposed to be 22 tonight. My friends back on the East Coast are already bragging about stuff they have in their gardens and stuff like that. But one thing that's great about the Klamath climate is that it's pretty dry during the gardening season. And so I rarely have to use very much of my plant pathology knowledge because gar uh, garden diseases of vegetables are far fewer here than in other places I have lived. So that's an example of climate being a natural control. The nice cold winters we have here also kill down a lot of populations of insects and keep that insect pressure pretty low for some. Other examples of natural controls in the system might be natural enemies of pests. So sometimes we forget how much things like dragonflies and birds and spiders and other things are doing in the garden without any effort from us at all. Uh, we also can think about geography. So, you know, if you're on an island, I was just uh, taught, my daughter and I were talking about parrots the other day, and I was talking about the kakapo, which is an endangered parrot in New Zealand. It became endangered when Europeans settled in there and brought all their cats and dogs with them who preyed on these ground-dwelling parrots to the extent that there's only a couple hundred of them left. And that was really rapid, right? So that was the geography of the island and then bringing a pressure into that that wasn't previously there. Uh, things like moisture and humidity, uh, supply and demand of resources. So if uh, water is really tight here and there's not much rainfall and I restrict my watering to just the root zone of my vegetables, I will have less weed pressure, yes, because the weeds didn't have what they needed to sprout. I can, uh, they didn't have the moisture they needed. And then uh, often in a short growing season, like we have here in the eastern part of the state, it means that there will be less rotations of the disease, the uh, 
insects over a growing season. So they're only going to have one generation a year instead of several. All right, so understanding that can just help you reduce any type of treatment, whether it's sprays or anything else that costs money. Um, it's also helpful to remember that a couple of our really common pests tend to spike under really specific conditions. So some of you might remember a couple years ago when we had that giant heat wave uh, very early in the summer. I saw more spider mites that year than I had seen any other year here. And I was like, oh, well, that wisdom is really bearing to be true for that particular pest. So again, these are not things that we have a control of, but understanding how they influence some of the critters that we're finding in our garden can be helpful. Host plant resistance is probably one of the places where um, gardeners really have a lot of options to work with. So we've been using resistant host plants for a long time. Um, tomatoes have been bred for resistance. We have all kinds of diseases that you can pick and choose tomato varieties that will be resistant to that. Uh, we also have lots of examples of wheat in field crops. Uh, Underhill wheat dates back to the time of Jefferson. However, um, that's Thomas Jefferson is what I meant there. Uh, however, uh, when we grow too much of one thing together, like we do in a really large farm where we have monoc monoculture cropping, um, that actually puts a lot of pressure on those resistance. And sometimes it will cause the resistance to not work so much over time. There have recently been cases of that with wheat in the um, in the Delta South, so like in the Gulf, um, Louisiana, uh, Texas area, where so much tropical uh, weather, so much rainfall over many years actually made some of the wheat varieties that they grow there were not resistant to Hessian wheat fly anymore. And so growers there had to start adopting new varieties because it wasn't working for resistance anymore. And they attributed that to just too much rain over time. Um, genetically modified crops, you might be surprised to know, are sometimes included as a host resistance in IPM. So depending on the resource that they that you might come across, some authors make the case that genetic modification is the ultimate host plant resistance, right? So um, I'll leave that there, but examples would be Bt corn, right? So Bt is an organic pesticide. It's a naturally occurring bacteria that we can use for caterpillar pests, but it's also been bred into some of our crops. Um, a lot of folks have concerns that that will lead ultimately to the possibility that BT won't be effective against caterpillar pests. Haven't seen anything to that effect yet, but that's uh, a concern that folks have out there. And then grafted vegetables is another host plant resistance that's relatively new. So we're seeing this most on tomatoes and cucurbits that are prone to soil borne diseases. And so they will graft the tomato or squash or melon onto a rootstock of one of those that is less prone to the soil borne diseases. And um, these plants end up being far more expensive, but in places where there's a history of soil borne disease, it could be a useful tactic. Keep in mind that soil borne diseases can persist for a very long time. All right. So, um, Regarding that tomato disease resistance, you know, tomatoes are the most common things that gardeners and our clients as master gardeners like to grow. So I do have a couple um, links here that have examples of some of the abbreviations that you can find for which diseases a particular variety of tomato might be resistant to. At one time you would see them on the tag, but I've noticed in the past few years that those really specific tags are pretty hard to come by. A lot of times it's a pretty generic tag that um, you don't really see that information, but you there's lots of charts out there. So particularly those of you that are in the wetter part of the state where you're gonna be more prone to 
soil-borne diseases. This is a great tool in using tomatoes. Uh, Cornell has a veggie IPM website that tracks a lot of resistance too. So uh, to be clear, for vegetable growers, a lot of this is disease related, but there are some insect resistant varieties as well. Regarding resistance, it's not the same as immunity. It just means that your plants have a better chance of withstanding that particular pest. You don't want to forget about scouting or just say, you know, I picked a resistant variety. I'm good to go. It's all done. But it can be a really useful tool. Cultural controls are all of the things that we do to our plants in the course of taking care of them. Um, and there are a lot of things that we can tweak to manage challenges. So uh, regarding disease, the picture that you see here of the overhead watering, that's probably one of the biggest contributors in the vegetable garden to disease. So to the extent that you can water at ground level and directly to the root zone, it keeps the leaf drier and keeps that overall moisture off the leaf. Some other examples of things that we can do that are more insect related would include rotation cropping, even moving things around. So let's think about spinach leaf miner as an example. We often recommend that you cover that with a row cover to keep the flies from being able to lay on your spinach. Well, if you plant your spinach in the same place that you planted it last year, and then put a row cover on it, you're trapping the flies in with the spinach because they're going to come up from where that spinach was last year. They drop into the ground to overwinter. See how knowing that about their life cycle tells me that I need to do rotation and cover them. So the moving the spinach keeps the them from being able to find it so easily when they come out of the ground. And then row covering it keeps them from being able to access the leaves to lay in should they find the spinach. Um, one cultural control that you'll see particularly for some of your shorter crops is to time your planting for when the weather or uh, to plant things as early as possible when there's lower pest pressure. In some parts of the state, this is really challenging to do, but um, this can be worked with a lot of pests where if you get things out earlier, then you're in that first and second generation, not the third, fourth, and fifth, where there's many, many more of the pests. Um, you might be surprised how helpful keeping your garden debris out of the garden and composting that somewhere else. You just might be surprised how useful of a tool that is. Um, in particular, for things like spotted wing Drosophila, if you're growing fruit, if you leave that fruit on the ground, it's more breeding spot. You want to actually remove it completely. Uh, just it, otherwise, it's not helpful to um, help you control that pest. You also can try diversification. So moving things around, growing a variety of things. Um, a lot of folks like to use companion planting. Research is very divided on that. I think um, it makes a lot of sense that the volatile oils in some of the plants, uh, like particularly some of our herbs, would be repellent to some pests. But if you truly look at specific research, you get a real mixed bag of results. Usually when that happens, it's because there's a whole bunch of other variables besides just the two plants and whatever pest you're thinking about, right? Their soil and maybe how they're being grown and a lot of other things that might contribute to the, those mixed results. And then remember your watering methods. You can use uh, disease-free seeds. So this can be really important in things like seed potato and, um, oh, what was the vegetable that I just found a bunch of disease that, that looked like it was seed borne. It'll come to me in a minute. Cultural control of keeping your plants from being stressed. You know, insects can smell a stressed plant. You don't want your plants stressed out. That makes them a beacon for pests. Another thing that can be helpful is to keep things 
not overly um, thick like a jungle. Do a little bit of thinning, get some airflow there, make it not such a ideal habitat for things to hide. Get rid of that crop residue. Uh, don't leave it in the ground for some pests. So this is one of the reasons why in crop farming, till or no till can be a thing. Be careful with your weed eater use so you don't um, invite pests in. And same with your mower deck. Mechanical and physical controls are some of the funniest ones to me. And um, there's some real interesting ones out there. But essentially, this is any kind of like net barrier trap. Um, knocking insects off a plant. My grandpa used to have a mason jar of soapy water that he carried around with him after dinner. And he'd just flick things into that. Um, he used that for like the bean beetles and things he found on his corn. There's all kinds of different repellent devices out there. Um, foil and moving objects are usually used for birds. And then uh, and one of the most novel ones I've come across is a tree shaking machine for nut pests. And deer repellents is in here as just a reminder, that's a whole nother talk. But here's an example of some of those mechanical controls, right? So uh, high fences for things like deer. Um, you've got all kinds of things for some of your non-insect pests as well. People ask about some of these. <clears throat> um, in a field situation, just a heavy trench can sometimes interrupt crawlers. In a greenhouse or high tunnel, um, we can do some exclusion there eventually pests get get in right we can try to exclude there's thrips cloth that we can use but you've got to have some type of uh ventilation there so eventually things do get in and folks that are able to use their greenhouse for a long time without shutting it down at all most of the time eventually they're going to end up with a really tough pickle of a pest problem uh, when you just are able to use it for long, long times without shutting it down and things build up in there and become really tough to get rid of. So the, sh the growing season that is interrupted by a true winter can be really helpful in that result. Um, so there's a lot of things that folks are doing now with plastic culture and high tunnel fruit to uh, provide barriers for particular insect best, uh, pests. So some of these could be applied to home gardens as well. And then um, row covers are really helpful for keeping some pests from getting to the plant material. Remember with row covers that we don't want to cover up things that need to be pollinated, right? So row covers are often recommended, for instance, for strawberries to keep strawberry pests off. But when they're in bloom, we need to have those lifted so the pollinators can get in. All right, next up is biological control. These are all of our beneficial insects. They can uh, include a whole range of things that we typically have in our gardens, although sometimes they're out of balance, right? So if we have a healthy soil, nematodes are gonna be there. Their predatory mites are so small, we don't know them. Uh, in our biological control, depending on the resource, some folks are gonna put your biopesticides in with biological controls. Others are gonna have that in the chemical control. So again, it's semantics. Just be aware that you'll see things that categorize them slightly differently. So you can purchase insects to control your pests. One of the most widely known ones is the ladybugs. But if you know about their life cycle, then you'll know that they spent some time in the refrigerator, basically hibernating before they were packaged to sell to you. And when you release them, they're really likely to just fly away. But if you bring them in, release them in the evening and cover them long enough for them to find the pests, maybe do a little mating, lay a few eggs before they escape, then there will be a whole bunch of ladybug larvae there soon who are actually more voracious eaters than the adults and they can do some control for you. But I've never seen a ladybug packet that actually explained how to keep them from flying away. All right. Um, 
the wick the bugwood wiki has a lot of options for commercially available biological controls if that's your thing beneficial insects are present in your system another program that i do that i'd be happy to do for you another time is um how to recognize the beneficial insects and specifically looking at attributes of the insects that could help you determine that it was a predator. There's a bunch of things that you can do to encourage beneficial insects. Um, diversification is really important. You know, OSU has a fabulous publication out now on encouraging pollinators in the garden. I'm working with Heather Stoven on one that's more general to all types of beneficial insects. It's um, almost ready to send out for review. But there's a lot of material out there on how to encourage your beneficial insects. And then your last tool is going to be your chemical controls. You guys have had safety, uh, personal safety training with your controls. They're last in an IPM program for a reason because a lot of them aren't compatible with all of the other things that we're trying to do there. But if we didn't do a good job of monitoring and scouting, we might catch it too late, right? So um, remember that your broad spectrums are going to kill beneficial insects if they come into contact with them as well. Um, and if we use all those other tools well, then we won't need as many chemicals and we definitely don't want to apply differently than the label. So one of the big problems with using too much is that it actually drives resistance up really quickly. And even our chemical companies are encouraging IPM now. So even some of the manufacturers of the chemicals, because there are some insects that just so quickly um, develop resistance, right? So green peach aphid is an example of an insect where there's biotypes and some races or biotypes of the aphids are just completely resistant to some chemicals. The poster child of insect resistance is diamond, diamondback moth that gets in all of the cabbage and brassica type crops. And so remember your modes of action if you get into some situation where um, you have to treat. And then um, the right tool for the right job. This is just an example of a client question that I got here when I was asked, what can I use for kudzu bug and collards? Can you tell that's a Southeastern question? Kudzu bug is not a pest of collards. They were just, um, the kudzu bugs were disturbed because the soybean field next to it had been harvested and it had scared them all out of the field. And I was like, I can't recommend anything for you to treat kudzu bug and collards. So the next question I was asked was, what can I use for worms and collards? I declined to make a suggestion for that one as well. All right, so you've got all these tools here. Um, I want to stop and look at the questions real quick. Uh, I have a question about emerald ash borer. It's not a predator. It is a wood boring beetle that disrupts the cambium. Um, and then there's a question about jumping worms in the Willamette Valley. And I'm sorry, but I'm not. I'm not going to be able to answer that because I don't know the answer to it. All right, so let's take a look at um, a couple examples then. So uh, the one on the right there are grubs of the Japanese beetle. And this is a pest that's recently been found in Oregon. Japanese beetle is a huge problem because it's a very generalist feeder that'll eat lots and lots of things, ornamentals as well as vegetables. So if you notice here, there's two different colors on the back of their abdomens, on the lower abdomens. One is black and one is white. And that's showing the difference in the grubs when they've been treated with a bacteria that's known as milky spore. So this is a treatment that you can do in your lawn if you get Japanese beetles and it actually keeps them they get this milky spore disease that keeps them from becoming an adult. So that would be either a biocontrol or a chemical, depending on how you classified that particular practice. And then another practice that is why is widely done for Japanese beetles is a physical trap with a lure. It's a really heavy flower scented lure. I can remember as a kid back in Virginia, my grandpa putting that trap at the edge of his corn. 
and he would get hundreds of them. It was really disgusting. And they would stop and feed on the corn near the trap, you know? And I can remember thinking as a kid, why does he put it somewhere else so they won't eat the corn? And he was like, well, they're in the corn. I'm getting them out of the corn. It is now recommended specifically that you try to put the trap not next to something the Japanese beetle really likes, right? So they do tend to rest quite a bit before they go into the trap. So you want to put this next to something that they're not going to be so prone to eating. It's a pretty long list, but you can probably find some somewhere to hang it. That's not right next to the thing you're trying to save. Um, so let's talk about aphids. That's one of our most common vegetable pests. So hopefully you see the aphids here. Um, here we have some pictures of some aphids like you might find if you were scouting in your yard. So in that upper picture, note that you have a couple different generations of aphids there, right? You know, under the right conditions, aphids can give live birth and they can be born pregnant. Aphids are pretty biologically astounding. So this is a prime example of why you want to try to catch it early if you can, because they can reproduce about a generation a week to 10 days uh, when conditions are great. But here we have three really swollen straw colored um, aphids. And these are examples of ones that have been parasitized by a little wasp and um, they leave a little hole in the um, backside of this aphid when they come out. So when you notice the aphids, one of the things that you definitely want to be looking for is these parasitized ones. So here we have the typical aphid. Remember when it gets too many, it turns into, it will have a, a winged generation so that it can spread out to other plants. You really want to catch it before they get winged because they're much difficult, more difficult to control when they're on multiple plants than they would be on one. You might be willing to sacrifice one plant and just chop, chop it back and put that in a black paper bag and cook all those aphids. But if they've spread to everything, you won't want to do that. And then another example of mummified aphid. So depending on the aphid species and which little tiny wasp is parasitizing it, the colors will be different. But notice that these aphid mummies are considerably larger and kind of dried out. And then if you ever see a little tiny hole on one of them, um, you'll also know that it has been parasitized. So whitefly is another one of our really common uh, vegetable pests. Whitefly um, spends most of its life as a larva stuck on the underside of a leaf. And then it becomes a pupa stuck on the underside of a leaf. This is the adult. Notice that this pupal case is like busted through, but is still stuck to the leaf. In this picture, you have a few pupal cases that are mostly gone off of the leaf, these little shadowy ones. Um, you've got some young larvae here that are kind of this yellowish color. Here's a little thrip. He's not supposed to be there. If you can see my cursor in the... Um, corner of the veins there, there's one little yellow thrip. But all these black white fly have been parasitized, probably by a little wasp, something like Encarcia formosa. And so when I look at this picture, at first, it looks like there are so many white fly there. That's so many. But then you realize, okay, about a fifth of them are just like the remnant of where the pupa was. So those are gone. And about half of them are parasitized. So here's a case where even though it looks like there's a whole bunch of them, I'm probably not going to do anything right away. I'm probably going to keep checking to see if a fair number of them are parasitized because more than likely these wasps can take care of this population for me. All right, let's take a look at some caterpillars. I hope that you can see these pictures here pretty well. Um, especially the one on the bottom. So a really helpful feature for ID and caterpillars is to take a good look at their pro legs. So this guy that's standing up on the leaf there, the head capsule is at the top here. This is the bottom picture. Then you've got three sets of legs. These are the true legs. But then on the back of this caterpillar, it's also got these crochets or pro legs. And so some have four sets of prolegs, some caterpillars have five, 
some have like a couple body segments with pro legs, then a body segment or two with no pro legs like this one, and then some more pro legs. And so that pro leg pattern is a, um, is a really good thing to hone in on, to look at the caterpillar and then compare that when you're trying to figure out what you're dealing with. That's a good one to be aware of. So caterpillar biology is pretty interesting too. They're very, very temperature dependent. So um, moisture and sunlight are going to have those eggs hatch quicker and also going to help the pupil, uh, the pupa formation, the metamorphosis happening. So I once worked in a butterfly conservatory and I thought it was very interesting. We had all these pupa that hung in a case, right? So people could see the emergence of these butterflies. And even though they were inside of a case, in a controlled environment inside of a room inside of a building those things never came out on rainy days the pupa never the, the adult butterflies never emerged on rainy days there's something they could still sense the humidity maybe but in the wild if a butterfly or moth comes out of that pupal case when it's raining the wings don't dry out properly and it's never able to fly right? So um, warm, sunny weather, these guys are going to multiply much more quickly. Cloudy, rainy weather, they're not going to multiply as quickly. You want to know how many generations you're dealing with. And no matter what treatment you're doing, the earlier you catch them, the better. So here's an example um, of the life cycle here with this moth. Eggs sometimes can be really hard to see, Look how tiny the early instar larvae are compared to these old older ones, right? So this is when they're most easiest to treat. When it's a fifth instar larva, they actually late in that in, uh, last instar there, a lot of caterpillars really slow down their eating as their body progresses toward turning into that pupa. So once you get here, most stuff isn't going to be very helpful for you in terms of treatment. And then there's not very much that's helpful for the adults because a lot of adults live only a couple days. They just multiply and die. Or for many uh, butterfly and moth species, only the females can feed as adults. So um, treatment is most important during these earliest instars. All right. And then here's a look at the cabbage looper. So you've got kind of a middle end star there. Notice the pro legs. There's two sets of pro legs, then a segment with no pro legs, and then the hind segment has pro legs. Look how different it looks when it's getting ready to pupate. Like it almost looks like a different caterpillar, doesn't it? And then the pupil stage, very little is going to get into it there in terms of uh, any type of chemical treatment or organic substance that you would put on it. And then the moth. So I always like to remember how different things can look at different stages. This is true for the beetles too. When we find beetles feeding on things, it's easy to mistake it for two different pests if larva and adults are feeding together. All right, this one's fruit, not vegetable. This could be such an effective IPM tactic in our home garden. When do things most often attack the fruit or the tomato or whatever? It's like right before we would want to eat it, right? So this idea of bagging individual fruit is actually pretty widely used in a lot of Asian countries to keep the fruit pristine. But um, one of the things that those countries have is much less expensive labor than we have. And so if this was widely used as a commercial product, we might have to pay like eight bucks for an apple and maybe we wouldn't be able to afford very much of the fruit. But for those of us that are growing things, remember this trick because this is a pretty neat exclusionary tactic that we could consider using. Um, brown marmorated stink bug is another critter that is uh, another wide ranging pest, right? It really feeds on a lot of things. And so, um, I moved here from North Carolina in that red zone. So I recognize this guy from there. Notice that in or Oregon and Washington, this pest is considered um, to be 
I can't quite read that. It's agricultural and something else problems, but to let you know that it has become a problem in Oregon too. Uh, my eyes are really bothering me today from driving. I'm sorry, I can't make that out. Um, so what can we do here? Well, this, this silly brown marmorated stink bug, it doesn't feed like our native stink bugs. They have the courtesy to stick their little straw-like mouth parts in the fruit one time and take their fill. And that's far less damaging to our fruits than what this brown marmorated stink bug does, which is take a little taste over here and then move three steps over and reinsert the mouth parts and take a little taste and then move four steps over. And what you end up with is a fruit that has bunches and bunches of puncture marks, right? And uh, sometimes if there's a lot of them, depending on when they hit the fruit, it'll make the fruit look really lumpy and cat faced, right? And it looks very unattractive, even though we could eat it, but it doesn't look good. So one of the best things we can do for this guy is learn to recognize these eggs and just take uh, the dull side of a knife and just scrape those right off of the leaf. Never let them, you know, get established. So with a lot of these ones that are crawling around, these are, are not particularly fast. You could try Grandpa Coffee's flicking it into the soapy water as well if you see them running around. But just be aware that this one attacks a wide range of things. It really likes a lot. So that hand picking could be an option. There are pheromone traps. Um, we should think about these with some caution. Again, are we attracting more of them to our garden before they came into a trap. Row covers could be helpful. There are um, several chemicals available. They're all broad spectrum things, if I remember correctly. And again, they're gonna be effective on the nymphs. So that doesn't help you very much with the adults. There is a potential wasp predator that is looking really promising. Some OSU folks are working on that and you can read more about it. It's called a samurai wasp. And then I want to wrap up with just walking through one vegetable and um, thinking about rating different IPM parts of a program. So these are a list of potential actions that you could take with potato IPM and then how high of a priority or how effective they would be. So crop rotation is highly important because a lot of the things that come to us in potatoes are coming in the soil. So you want to move them to a different place, right? Um, winter cover crop is helpful, but not as much of a priority as actually moving that crop from one place to the next. Minimizing spring tillage and promoting the beneficials in this particular crop has not turned out to be as useful as just making sure that you get rid of all of the waste, right? So this is another one of those sanitation ones. That one can be more effective. Buying certified seed potatoes for disease and resistant variety. And then avoiding bruising or using some extra caution when you're actually cutting your seed pieces on potatoes. So that would be an example of a cultural practice that we did. And then after planting or at planting, sorry, um, here's some other things that we can think about at planting time. So inspecting the seed before you even put it in, culling out problematic uh, seed potatoes before you putting in. Again, with the avoiding bruising, Right. And I'll tell you that if you were in the South with sweet potatoes, this would be even more important. Sweet potatoes bruise horribly. Uh, sanitizing between all of your seed lots, uh, applying fungicide in fur furrow, those are both considered pretty high priorities. The soil temperature or warming the seed pre plant, those are often recommended but are less of a priority. And then adjusting the um, plant depth is another one that's considered of medium variety so or priority. So these are ju were just analyzed using different research to show like what had the biggest effect. But I think it's also a great example of a wide variety of tools that could be used on just one particular product. So don't forget how helpful our PNW handbooks can be. We also have a newer website now called Solve Pest Problems that um, has some parts of it pretty robustly developed and we'll have additions to that on a regular basis. And I think I'm right on time here, but I will take a look at the questions if that's okay. Let's see.
That was great, Nicole. Um, yeah, there's a, a couple of questions down there. It would be really helpful if you could address those. Sure. So I see, how do you suggest increasing humidity in a greenhouse to deter spider mite without encouraging diseases? So that's a great question. Um, an evaporative cooling system, if you can do one of the ones that has the, um, like the cells that drain down on one side of it, the old fashioned evaporative cooling system, that can be really helpful for increasing humidity. My greenhouse is really, really small. It happens to be built off of the back of my house. It was a deck that was already there and I enclosed it in twin wall and there was already a dog door there. So I have been experimenting with putting a fan on the inside of the dog door, hanging a towel over that door that is in a, like a tray of water and like trying to get it to wick up the water. I think I might try an evaporative cooling cell in front of that dog door. And I mentioned that just as an example, because you'll have to maybe be creative depending on what your situation is. Um, you might try just like a barrel of water with an oxygenizing pump that keeps it moving around even. Um, if you wanted to test if that was actually making a difference at all, there are monitors out there now. Like I'm using one called the Kestrel Drop. Kestrel like the bird, and then drop number two. I'm using to monitor some different environmental parameters and season extension here in Klamath for some research. And the humidity is one of the things that they measure. So you could put one of those in there before and after whatever you tried to see if you were actually moving the needle any on your humidity, or if it was just, if it just felt like it. Recommendations for squash bug control Egg removal is really, really helpful for those particular guys. So uh, they have all of your um, pentatomids that are shaped like the, the brown marmorated stink bug. They all have a barrel shaped egg. The leaf footed bug that gets in squash has like a coppery football shaped egg, but learning how to recognize their eggs and just scraping them off with a knife if you can get them before they even have a chance to feed, that's one of the easiest things to do. I hope you're not squeamish about it, but it really does work. Uh, Mark asks, what materials can you use for bagging fruit to prevent infestation? So they're just using a plain brown paper sack. Yeah, the, there's a whole discussion in chat about yep. using nylon footsies. Okay, I'm working on it. I see where jet I'm rolling through it. I see the humidity question. Aphids are evil. Indeed they are. And so biologically information. Thank you for letting me know. You could see the cursor there. Somebody's been having something in their house. The small, thin white paper bags. I think also like a really thin waxed paper could work. Nylon footsies work. I didn't, haven't tried that one. How nice is that? And I'll say, I love that because, you know, my grandparents grew up in the depression and they used to save all their hoes that had runs in them and they would bag the onions in them and they would use them to tie up things to the stakes, but they had the, the nylon hose and they would put a drop of onion, tie a knot, drop of onion, tie a knot. And so they could just cut it off wherever they wanted to bring however many onions into the house. So many uses for those. Oh, someone, Patty said, I think maybe they were asking, is there a predator for the emerald ash borer? I think that there actually is, but I can't remember what it is. Thanks for that clarification. It looks like you might've heard that uh, encouragement from my parrot in the background. It looks like a few folks have tried the nylon footsies. So that's a new one. I'll give that a try. All right. I think I've covered all the questions now. I hope that you found something that could be helpful and um, that you'll be willing to keep a journal because I think that's with insects and particular areas. I think that's one of the most helpful things. I had a big problem with Mexican bean beetle for a long time when I lived in the South. 
And then I stumbled across a variety of green beans that they just didn't like. And I had three varieties of green beans one year and they just devastated two of the three. And then the third variety they didn't like. And if I hadn't kept a gardening journal, I never would have remembered the next year, which one was the variety that I needed. Stephen, I'll take it back to you. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, thank you so much, Nicole. That was just full of some tremendous information. Um, I will reinforce your recommendation of the Solve Pest Problems site, which I've been enjoying immensely. Um, everyone's still out there. This should be posted to the LCMGA YouTube site within about two weeks and if you've got any more questions then think about it for a while and get in touch with your local extension office thank you very much nicole and thanks everyone have a good night good night